Okay. All right. Well, it's eight o'clock. Um, let's get started. Thank you, everybody, and welcome to the Department of Medicine uh, Grand Rounds. Uh, and today to introduce our um, speaker, Dr. David Rubin, we will have Dr. Sanjay Asthana from uh, the Division of Geriatrics um, for the introductions. So Sanjay, take it away. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Schnapp. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks for calling into the Grand Rounds. Um, it is true pleasure um, and a privilege to introduce today's speaker, Dr. David Rubin. Uh, Dr. Rubin is uh, director of the UCLA multi-campus program in geriatric medicine and gerontology. He's the Archstone Foundation Endowed Chair in Geriatrics and Chief of the UCLA Division of Geriatrics. Uh, Dr. Rubin is a world-renowned geriatrician and a gerontologist and is internationally acknowledged for his research and expertise uh, in dementia care, in quality of care research, uh, and patient-centered outcomes research. Uh, he received his MD from Emory University School of Medicine, did his residency in internal medicine at Brown University, and did a geriatric fellowship at the UCLA program where he stayed on and has now become the chief of the program. Uh, Dr. Rubin has so many national, international leadership roles uh, but I wanted to highlight some, some of his most prominent one. He has served as chair of the Board of American Board of Internal Medicine, ABIM. Uh, he's also currently a member of the Board of Trustee of the ABIM Foundation and a treasurer of the, of the uh, Board of, uh, of the ABIM Foundation. He has served in the past as president of the American Geriatric Society, and he just in March of this year, co-chair the NIH Summit on the uh, care services and support for persons with dementia and their caregiver. Uh, in addition to these prominent national roles, Dr. Rubin has served as a member of multiple committees of the National Academy of Science. Uh, he has also served as a member of the Institute of Medicine Committee, and many of these committee reports have become the national landmarks uh, in medicine and geriatric medicine. Uh, he's also been a member of the National Research Council of the National Quality Forum of multiple committees at NIH um, and also the Gerontological Society of America. Uh, Dr. Rubin, um, I counted yesterday, has nearly 20 honors and award, but I think the most prominent one that he is the lifetime national associate of the National Research Council of the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, he also received the Joseph T. Freeman Award from the Gerontological Society of America and the Edward Henderson Award from the American Geriatric Society. Dr. Rubin has been funded by NIH and multiple other federal agencies for the last 33 years. Uh, he has published more than 200 papers, 42 books, and 40 book chapters. And among his most prominent funded studies, that have uh, resulted in uh, publication of uh, papers in New England Journal uh, include the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation Award uh, for UCLA Alzheimer's Program. Uh, he also uh, is one of the PIs of the PCORI NIA funded STRIDE program, which was the multifactorial uh, prevention strategy uh, for falls. And I believe that paper just got published in New England Journal. Uh, and uh, he's also uh, received multiple other grants uh, from the Academic Foundation and NIH. Uh, and finally, I just want to share with you that Dr. Rubin, it's a true privilege for me, has served as my own mentor ever since I was an early stage faculty member at Hopkins and then University of Washington. Um, and you can see, uh, you know, his mentoring is truly an honor, and I'm deeply indebted to Dr. Rubin for decades of his mentoring from my own career. So with that, I'll hand over the presentation to Dr. Rubin. David. Thank you very much. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be here, at least virtually. Uh, it's a little after six in the morning, and if I weren't here, I'd probably be just sleeping. So uh, in any event, uh, we're gonna talk about um, uh, health care of older persons and uh, time to think different. Um, what does that title mean? Uh, some of you uh, may be old enough to remember uh, in the 1990s, there was a uh, campaign by uh, Apple Computer, uh, a Think Different campaign. And Think Different is 
is not the same thing as thinking differently. Thinking differently is, is you know, we all know people who think differently. Sometimes we try to avoid those people. But the, the uh, thinking different is, is thinking about something that could be different, a different landscape, a different environment. So that's, that's what we're gonna talk about. Uh, we'll start with the background, talking a little bit about the older population. Then I'm gonna spend some time on population health uh, and then most of the talk will be about um, uh, practice redesign. And that uh, includes three different categories, uh, fixing a problem or inefficiency in patient care, exploiting technology, and using people different or uh, different, uh, different people or people differently. I'll give two examples of co-management, which is something that I, I'm very interested in. And finally, as a reprise, we'll go back to population health. So beginning with older Americans, uh, there's some uh, recent demographic data, and uh, I want to I have them here really to highlight something that I generally don't do. Um, so right now we are at 52.4 million uh, people uh, as of 2018. Those are the most recent data, and that's about 15.6% um, uh, of the population. And it's, it's somewhat diverse, 23% are ethnic minorities, but the, uh, economic, uh, the ethnic diversity is going to grow substantially uh, over the next 20 years. Uh, so about a third of the population will be uh, ethnic minorities by that point. Um, almost 10% live in poverty. That means over 90% do not live in poverty. Uh, about one in five men, including myself, uh, and about a uh, excuse me, uh, 20, over uh, one in five men and 33% uh, percent of women uh, live alone. And that's because when, uh, men die earlier. And about a quarter of men and uh, almost 20% of the women are still in the workforce, like myself. Um, uh, and this is a very important uh, figure, is that about 62% uh, have two or more chronic conditions. So older people, by and large, they may be healthy, but they, they do have chronic conditions. Uh, we always think about older people as being frail and, and disabled, uh, but only about 14% uh, have uh, disabilities in their instrumental or independent activities of daily living. Uh, those are shopping, driving, doing laundry, those kinds of things. And uh, only 8% uh, are disabled in self-care. And what you mean, what this means is if you flip this around, that the vast, vast majority of older people are highly functional. And that's illustrated by um, that only 4% of people 65 to 74 need caregivers. And that rises to 20% if you're over 85. Though the bottom line of this uh, little uh, demographic overview is that older Americans are a very diverse group. So you've seen one older person, you've seen one older person. So that leads us to population health. And this was defined uh, uh, back uh, around uh, the turn of the century as being the health outcomes of a group of individuals, including the distribution of such outcomes within the group. So think about population health, you might think about the state of Wisconsin as being your population. Or you might think about the University of Wisconsin Medical Center. Or you might think about the VA. Uh, so there, there are many different populations to think about, but think about the population that you're interested in. So for any population, uh, this is a kind of a universal figure, you can separate them into a pyramid. So there's the top 1%, then the 2 to 5%, the 6 to 20%, uh, and on down. And you can use any metric you want. You can use costs of care, you can use how much hospital utilization, uh, disease severity, disability. And then you can tailor interventions to uh, people based on where they are in this population. And we'll get back to that a little later. Uh, Population-based interventions, um, uh, I like to use the Donabedian framework uh, which is structure, process, and outcomes. And the easy way to think about this is um, 
uh, here in California, we, we worry a lot about fires. And so uh, in terms of uh, quality uh, regarding fires, you wanna have structural aspects. So you wanna have fire stations, you wanna have, um, uh, you want to have fire trucks, you want to have water available, you want to have the planes uh, that carry water, uh, process. So you want to have processes that if you call um, 911 or you call the fire department, that something will happen. Uh, the whole idea of race uh, to get people uh, to uh, what to do when a fire comes. And then uh, finally, our outcomes. And those might be how many homes uh, are saved or how many lives are lost. So structure, process, and outcome. Uh, that um, so the whole purpose of this is towards meeting uh, the CMS uh, quadruple A, and uh, that includes better care. Better care involves having a structure and a process. Uh, better health that includes outcomes. Uh, lower costs um, that's something that uh, we're very interested in uh, as a society because the less money we spend on healthcare, the more money we can spend on things like education and the arts. Uh, and then finally, provider satisfaction. This is the most recent uh, component of the uh, Medicare AIM. And this is because we don't want our physicians, our nurses uh, to be burned out. So we're gonna focus on practice redesign. And uh, this uh, is aimed at uh, combining interventions aimed at uh, structure and process uh, with the intent of improving quality or increasing efficiency by either uh, fixing a problem or inefficiency, exploiting technology, or using different people with people differently. So first we'll talk about uh, fixing in inefficiency. And the first thing to do, and uh, this applies to everybody who's on this call, is to delegate data collection. And I like to think about this somewhat as a as Zagreb diagram, uh, Zagreb guide. So uh, well, these are concentric circles, and in the uh, center of the circle are, is the physician patient encounter. Uh, that's what you're doing uh, in, in the examining room, that's what you're doing uh, on rounds uh, when you're seeing a patient, and that's the most expensive. Um, so I have four dollars there because you, uh, the physicians, are, are most places the most highly paid person uh, in the uh, healthcare system. The second uh, is the office visit, and that's where you have uh, a number of uh, personnel. You have LVNs, medical assistants, um, uh, front and back office people, and they're considerably less expensive. And then the third level uh, of uh, delegation is to, uh, to patients themselves and their caregivers. And that, I have a dollar sign there, but you know, the postage stamp is still less than a dollar. So, uh, and a lot of this is now being done uh, electronically. So the two principles for this are, are one, you want to reduce the amount of time, but to increase the effectiveness and efficiency of the inner circle. This is really your quality time. Uh, and then you always want to delegate as much as push as much as possible to outer circles as you can. And, and we do this all the time in medicine and medical education is that uh, the attending, think about the attending as the inner circle, think about the resident as being the second circle, think about the medical student, and you're, you're always kind of delegating as much as possible. So uh, delegating to patients. Uh, one of the things we have is an 18 page pre-visit questionnaire. Uh, 18 pages, why? Is because we're dealing with old people and uh, we wanna have nice fonts and we wanna be big and easy to read. And we spend a lot of time actually on these pre-visit questionnaires, enormous amounts of time. But it collects all this information that you would have to collect during an interview. Um, and uh, uh, it does it in a very structured way so that you can either can populate a note or you can dictate from it. The second is delegation to office staff. Uh, and this can be screening or, or case identification, such as fall screening or cognition screening, uh, history gathering to follow up on, on false, on, on uh, positive screens, uh, reviewing the medications and the allergies, and then what I like to call uh, enhanced vital signs or physical examination things. So orthostatic blood pressure readings, 
Uh, I will tell you a little bit later on, it's very difficult to get a physician to do orthostatic blood pressures, incredibly difficult. Uh, but uh, other uh, members of the healthcare team can, we'll talk about that later. Visual acuity testing, uh, monofilament uh, for people who have diabetes, PHQ-9. So I will tell you that uh, before every clinic session, I have a huddle. My huddle includes my patient services representative, that's my back office person, uh, the, the nurse who will be working with me that day and myself. And we will go through the entire uh, session, uh, all the patients I'm going to see, and I will tell them what I'd like to have in advance of me being in the room with them. So, so-and-so needs an orthostatic blood pressure check, so-and-so needs a VHQ-9, and uh, these things are, are waiting for me when I get into the room. And finally, the other delegation is, is patient education. There's a lot of literature on that. So uh, this is a study I did with a, a resident a number of years ago, um, where we looked at uh, eight studies uh, uh, that uh, measured quality of care. And this is generally through um, uh, ACO quality measures for older people and PCPI measures. Uh, that's a physician consortium for practice improvement. Um, and uh, these were quality indicators for falls, urinary incontinence, and dementia, uh, all conditions we see a lot in older people. And we found that the quality indicators that physicians performed compared to delegating to nurse practitioners, compared to delegating um, to medical assistants or LVNs, uh, it was a dose response. The, the more you delegated, the better the quality. And if you were able to delegate to, to a nurse practitioner, a physician associate assistant, or an RN, 1.4 times more likely to be passed than if it was the physician's role. So the next way we uh, we um, fix an inf uh, is uh, to do practice resign is uh, exploiting uh, technology. And, and who am I to say anything about uh, the electronic health record? People who are in Madison. Uh, I mean, that is kind of the home of the, uh, uh, the mecca of the electronic health record. Uh, but let me just say some of the features that I think um, have been uh, really assets to uh, adoption of electronic health record. Uh, copy forward uh, has been uh, a great time saver. It has tremendous advantages and tremendous disadvantages because things get perpetuated uh, over and over again. Uh, this may change in January because they're changing how we do billing and how we do documentation, but it is a very valuable feature. Uh, something called reflex additional testing, and this is where somebody has a positive urinalysis uh, that they will send it for a culture, but if it's negative, uh, they won't. Uh, one of my very favorites is add-on testing. So here I'll order a CBC in the office and it comes back with uh, the patient being anemic, and I can order iron studies using a previously collected specimen, uh, and that saves the patient another stick, and I generally have the results by the next morning. Uh, reminders, uh, we have, uh, I'm certain you guys use these as well, uh, our best practices advisories, we're gonna talk a little bit more about those later, how they can be helpful. Uh, something that I like are, um, uh, eight, uh, some active engagement, uh, particularly ADT notices. Uh, these are admission, discharge, uh, and transfer notices. So if one of my patients turns out to be getting a uh, injection of their spine for uh, an epidural, uh, I hear about it, or if they get admitted to the hospital, I hear about it. Uh, patient entry into the electronic health record, uh, such as open notes, uh, this is going to be more and more uh, important uh, with the um, Cure Act of uh, 1920, uh, 2020, um, where uh, people have access to their notes and can suggest edits to them. Uh, and uh, uh, finally, identifying and referring patients for treatment. Uh, and this is a, a, a very nascent but very interesting field of um, mining the electronic health record and uh, using algorithms to uh, to identify patients and uh, recommend treatments. And we'll, we'll talk more about that at the end. Uh, uh, finally, uh, telehealth, 
uh, and mobile and, uh, and remote technologies. Obviously, the past year has been a dramatic shift in this as uh, we've been dealing with COVID-19, uh, the switch towards uh, video and uh, telephone visits, and, and finally Medicare uh, actually covering these. Uh, we're not sure how long that's going to last. Uh, I would say we're still very much on a learning curve here. Uh, for some of my patients, the telehealth visits have been very valuable. Uh, for others, it's it's been uh, it's been a, a poor second place, a poor substitute. Using uh, different people, um, so here uh, one of the, the, the examples is scribes, and we did some very early research uh, with scribes showing they uh, they improved efficiency considerably, uh, and that physicians loved them. Uh, some more recent research has shown that they, they actually improve quality. But I, I think that uh, scribes are, for the most part, uh, a, um, a stopgap measure, because I think as the electronic record, health record improves and we start using more um, transcription or basically uh, voice recognition, uh, much of this is going to uh, go away and we're going to be able to document much more quicker uh, and efficiently uh, uh, in using uh, voice recognition rather than somebody actually handwriting. Uh, we have something called comprehensive care coordinators at UCLA. Uh, these are uh, lay people, generally college graduates, occasionally masters, who do much of the work uh, that social workers uh, used to do. Uh, but one of the things they do that's most important is they ensure that people don't fall through the cracks. They're the ones who make sure that follow-up calls are, are done with people who are discharged from hospital. They make sure they have follow-up visits uh, in a prompt a period of time. They ensure that uh, the specialist appointments uh, are made. So if this is a, a new role. Uh, they call them different things at different places. Uh, community health workers or promotories, uh, these are people who are not even with the healthcare system. Uh, but they are, are helping uh, people uh, implement um, self-management and self-care. And an example that we have uh, created was uh, something called a dementia care assistant. Uh, these are people who are generally out of college who do a lot of work in our dementia care program. Uh, the important thing is that dementia care assistants allow the panel of the um, dementia care specialists, and I'll talk more about that in a moment, to be increased from 250 to 300. So what you're doing is you're using uh, a, a new person to uh, take offload a lot of the work of somebody who is a very highly paid person. So getting back to those, those circles that you're having somebody who's less expensive uh, do work that uh, previously has been done by somebody who is more expensive. So we're, we're gonna talk a, a good bit about uh, co-management. And this is uh, two or more healthcare providers jointly managing patients' care to achieve the best quality and outcomes. Uh, some people also refer to this as collaborative care. It's just kind of you know, where, you, where you come from and what they refer to it. And this can be uh, for specific quest, uh, conditions. So, for example, uh, when I have patients with cancer, um, I generally do not manage their cancer. Uh, I always have an oncologist involved, uh, so we co-manage the patients and we communicate very well. Uh, another example that I'm going to go into in some depth is dementia. Um, it could also be for multiple conditions and coordination of care. Uh, a colleague of mine, Chad Bolt, had some, quite a bit of success with a nurse uh, doing what they call guided care, which touched on a lot of different geriatric conditions. Uh, these can be a physician specialist and a physician generalist or a surgeon doing collaborative care co-management or it can be another health professional and a physician uh, and that's what i'm going to focus on mostly in a few moments some, some models outside geriatrics there was a kind of a i thought a very important paper published six years ago uh, where they considered they compared a nurse manager the meta-analysis of um, uh, nurse managed care compared to usual care for several chronic conditions. And what they found is that the uh, nurses who co-managed the care had lower uh, patients, their patients had lower uh, hemoglobin A1Cs, 
uh, lower blood pressure and lower uh, LDL levels. And we have found similar work in, in, in geriatrics. Um, this is uh, our, our, the percentage of quality indicators that are passed uh, and for three conditions, falls, incontinence, of dementia. And pretty much every time that you had a co-management with a nurse practitioner, it essentially tripled uh, the uh, quality of care. Uh, and that's for falls, incontinence, of dementia. And looking under the hood a little bit, these are uh, some, um, some quality indicators, and these are typically the if-then statements uh, for, for the care of falls. So a falls history alone, a physician acting by her himself, 45% uh, doubled. Uh, orthostatic blood pressure checked. So this is something that I mentioned early on, you can't get a physician to do this. Uh, indeed, um, uh, in this study, and we've, we've seen this in two or three studies, it's always uh, less than 10%. Uh, the docs just don't have the time. It's kind of not in their skill set. But if you have it delegated to a nurse practitioner, about 80%. Uh, visual testing, once again, much more common if nurse practitioners do it because it's their job. Uh, gait balance and strength examinations, home health uh, hazard evaluations, exercise and physical therapy, all of these are higher quality uh, if, if there's shared responsibility. So if you're going to do a co-management pro uh, uh, program, uh, there are a lot of things to think about. First is your target population. Uh, once again, we were talking about population health earlier, but here you would be doing a segment of the population. So your segment of the population might be people who fall. Uh, it might be high utilizers. Uh, it might be uh, people who have dementia. It might be people who have heart failure. It might be people who have diabetes or COPD. And then you want to select the model and the people. And I can't, uh, I can't emphasize this a lot, enough, uh, is how it's going to work in terms of co-management. And we'll talk about that in a few moments. And the people. Is, is the person who's going to do the co-management, is it another physician? And we have an example of that uh, we're doing at UCLA with, uh, with osteoporosis. Uh, is it going to be a nurse practitioner or a physician assistant? Uh, is it going to be a nurse? Uh, and we'll show you some examples of that. But that's a very important decision is the level of the person. And then the process of care is pretty, pretty standard. Uh, there is an assessment, a uh, care plan that's developed, and then communication with the primary care provider, which is exceptionally important. We'll get to that in a moment. Monitoring the response and then revising the care plan. So here are some of the challenges. Number one is defining uh, the scope of responsibility. And sometimes this is referred to as jurisdiction. Uh, what is the co-management person's responsibility? What is the primary care provider's responsibility? Uh, range of clinical problems. So let's say you're managing dementia and that person with dementia falls or is having a problem with falls or incontinence. Is that the, the uh, purview of the uh, co-management person, or is that a pur purview of the, um, of the primary care provider? And it, it varies. And even within a program, it varies in terms of physician preferences. Order writing. Does the co-management team have the right to, to write orders? Is that a response shared responsibility? Or does that all go through the primary care provider? Uh, when acute clinical problems happen, who gets called? Is it the co-management people or is it the primary care provider? And these have to be worked out on an individual basis. And then communication with primary care physicians. How does that work? Is it just a, a, a copy of the note? Uh, is it um, something that is a, um, a in-basket message? Uh, is it a phone call? Is it, a, is it another kind of communication? Uh, communication with other healthcare providers, including therapists and uh, specialists, and then with community-based organizations. Certainly with older people, um, uh, academic institutions and healthcare systems are not um, islands to themselves. Uh, they have to reach out to community-based organizations for additional services. And how do you communicate? Because it's not so easy as just sending a note because of HIPAA compliance, uh, because of issues of uh, health information technology exchange, 
some of these places, uh, small community-based organizations, they simply don't have the infrastructure or the technical support. So I'm gonna talk about two different examples. Uh, the first is one that Sanjay uh, mentioned, and that's the STRIDE study. Um, this was a, a pragmatic trial aimed at uh, answering the question whether redesigning medical practices and engaging patients to improve quality reduces serious fault-related injuries and improve other outcomes. Uh, this was co-funded by PCORI and uh, NIA. It's the, the largest study that PCORI has ever funded. It was about $30 million of their money. Uh, it was a cluster randomized superiority trial. It's a pragmatic trial. Uh, over 5,000 participants and 86 practices at 10 sites, a 20 month of intervention and 20 month of follow up. Uh, and these are, uh, are the sites. You'll notice that uh, Wisconsin is surrounded. There was no Wisconsin trial site, but it was surrounded. So the Midwest was well represented. So these were community dwelling uh, older persons, 70 years of age. Uh, or older, and they had to have a risk factor for falls. And these are the kind of common things that uh, this kind of screening uh, can be done by a, um, a medical assistant in the waiting room, uh, while patients in the waiting room, but falls and hurt themselves in the past year, they fall on two or more times in the past year, or they have fear of falling because of balance or gait. So this is not the general population. This is a sub subsegment of the population that you've identified that's at higher risk. So here we, uh, in the co-management, we decided that this would be a registered nurse. Uh, the vast majority were uh, bachelor's level nurses rather than uh, diploma level nurses. Uh, and they were called false care managers. And what they did was um, they conduct risk assessment, they engage patient uh, in self-management. A lot of this was uh, through um, um, motivational interviewing, uh, trying to find out what the patient is willing to bring in, what, what they want to work on, uh, what's most important to them. Uh, for each patient, um, they developed a fall injury prevention plan, uh, and then this care plan needed to be approved by the primary care provider. Uh, the false care manager could directly implement some recommendations, such as referring to community-based exercise programs or teaching home exercises, uh, but others uh, needed to be implemented by the primary care provider, such as reducing medications. Uh, they would monitor and support the patient's progress and revise the plan as necessary. So these are the risk factors. Uh, I think people will agree that these are important risk factors for falls. Uh, medication risk, uh, they have these things called the uh, fall risks increasing drugs or FRIDs. Uh, we target that in alcohol. Um, postural hypotension, visual impairment, feet and footwear problems, uh, osteoporosis, which is not a risk factor for falls, but is a risk factor for serious falls related injuries, strength, gait and balance disorders, and then home safety risk. So uh, what did we find in the study? Uh, the effect on the primary outcome, uh, first, it indicated serious falls related injury, and that meant they basically had to be seen by a medical provider and, uh, or hospitalized or, or have fractures. Uh, overall, it was, uh, the effect was less than we expected. We anticipated a 20% effect size, and what we got was an 8% effect size. Uh, and that was consistent across a number of different outcomes, many ways in which we measured this and across subgroups. Um, and uh, although we, there was no statistical significance for the primary outcome, a secondary outcome, which was the time to self-reported fall injury was positive. Um, but overall, uh, this was something that was uh, disappointing. We had hoped to have a positive uh, outcome so uh, why was the effect size smaller? Uh, adherence may have been lower in a pragmatic trial versus an efficacy trial. So these were set up in, in, in providers' offices. The only additional resource they had basically was the fall care manager. And some of the uh, adherence to things uh, was, uh, was there were barriers. There was costs, there were costs of doing physical therapy, there were transportation issues of getting to 
um, community-based exercise programs. Uh, we, we heard this uh, there were the, from a lot of uh, participants that there were barriers. Uh, we did not manage uh, uh, monitor adherence to exercise programs because this was a pragmatic trial. It was something that you would not do in clinical practice. And uh, they were referred to existing services without new resources. So if you think about an efficacy trial, you'd have a physical therapist that you would deploy to these people or some kind of an exercise program that was specifically deployed for these people. Uh, not so, they're using existing resources. Uh, the motivation interviewing uh, may have led to selection of easier but less powerful recommendations. So the, the, uh, the recommendations chosen less frequently were things like medication reduction. People didn't want to get off their Z drugs or their benzodiazepines. Uh, they didn't like home safety uh, recommendations. They, they, they would prefer to have clutter uh, around their houses. Uh, participants or physicians may have chosen less effective approaches to risk management. So we saw a lot of people who chose to calcium and vitamin D as opposed to bisphosphonates for osteoporosis. And they were part of this was because they were afraid of atypical fractures. But regardless, they chose they they were adherent, but they were adherent to a less effective treatment. Um, there's also a possibility, and we've seen this in some studies, where you can actually improve quality, but it doesn't necessarily translate to improvement of outcomes. So there, there, you always have to consider that, that process outcome link and how tight it is. And finally, 14% of the people randomized to the intervention did not receive it. Uh, you see this all the time in pragmatic trials. Um, so what do we make of this? Um, so after crying in our, in our beer for a few nights, uh, we kind of tried to pick up the pieces. Uh, it was adequately powered to protect, detect a 20% difference, but not a smaller difference. But uh, interestingly enough, uh, it is about the same effect size as the Connecticut Collaboration for Fault Prevention that was published um, oh, about 10 or 15 years ago. But that was statistically significant because the sample size was much larger than the entire state of Connecticut. It's also uh, in the same ballpark, uh, in fact, a little more powerful than the most recent US Preventive Services Task Force uh, meta-analysis that it used for its recommendation about multi-component interventions, and that showed a 6% difference. So uh, what, do, what do you do with these kind of findings? Uh, first of all, is an 8% effect size worth investing in? Well, if you consider the uh, annual cost of falls being $50 billion per year, uh, if you had an 8% reduction, that would save about $4 billion. Uh, which would have to be weighed against the cost of the intervention. And then uh, can the intervention be made more powerful? Uh, can, can, uh, can things uh, be done to increase adherence to recommendations? So one of the things that we're doing uh, here at UCLA uh, is we've taken uh, uh, the, uh, the, um, uh, the rubble and uh, all the destruction that uh, was done in the, uh, the stride study, and we're picking it up and re, uh, re uh, building a uh, false intervention program using the things that work really well at stride and then adding local resources to try to make it more powerful. So I'm going to switch gears and give the second example of the uh, co management program, which is the UCLA Alzheimer's and Dementia Care Program. This is a, was started as a clinical program um, with goals of maximizing patient function, independence, and dignity, uh, minimizing caregiver strain, and reducing unnecessary cost. Remember that uh, dementia, regardless of the form of dementia and the type of dementia, is not a curable disease, uh, and the treatments we have, the medical treatments, are, are not all that good. So this began with a grateful patient. Uh, uh, actually, and his friend who put about a million dollars into the program, and we plan to have 250 patients in the program. And, and then we hit the lottery. Uh, we got one of the first round one uh, CMMI Innovation Challenge Awards, uh, and that was designed to expand the program to 1,000 patients. Uh, and currently, we've seen over 3,000 patients in the program, and about 700 uh, are, are currently active. Um, 
this program approaches the patient and the caregiver as a dyad. You can't treat just one. Uh, if you treat only the patients, uh, uh, their uh, caregivers are gonna be unsupported and they're gonna burn out. Uh, it recognizes this is a long incurable journey. Um, our first patient uh, who's in the dementia care program has now been followed by eight, for eight years and is still having behavioral problems. Uh, provides a comprehensive care that is based in the healthcare system, but reaches out to the community and our community partners have been exceptionally valuable. Uh, it is a co-management model that uses a nurse practitioner dementia care specialist who does not assume primary care of the patient, but works directly with uh, physicians by conducting in-person needs assessments and resource assessments. Uh, these typically are 90 minutes long. Develop and implement individualized dementia care plans, monitors uh, the response of these, and providing access 24 hours a day, 365 days a year for emergency. And uh, much of that is actually the, the call is shared with our, our geriatrics division. We also partner with community-based organizations to do things like adult daycare, not so much right now in COVID-19, counseling, case management, legal and financial advice, and also on training the workforce. Uh, making sure that the caregivers are are, are well uh, uh, suited to, to provide care. Uh, this uh, harkens back to a previous slide. Uh, what is the quality of care? And we're gonna go through the quadruple outcome, uh, 92%. And this is based on medical record abstractions. Uh, satisfaction, this is the fourth of the quadruple aim. Uh, we asked the doctors how they felt about it. Uh, these were nurse practitioners giving valuable recommendations uh, to the doctors 61% of the time. 85% uh, of the doctors thought they provided valuable behavioral recommendations. Over two thirds thought it helped uh, the physician patient relationship. And over half thought it, um, it uh, saved them time. And 90% uh, would recommend it for other people. Indeed, we stopped advertising uh, for this several years ago, and what we're getting are five to 15 referrals per week. So one-year outcomes, these are clinical outcomes. Um, the, uh, the orange at the top is functional status, and then below there, and, and uh, below there is the mini mental state examination, which is a cognitive measure. And in these cases, you see change over one year but it's in the wrong direction, that uh, mental uh, cognition declines and that functional status worsens. So this is not a treatment for Alzheimer's disease. It does not change the disease, but you'll see that behavioral symptoms uh, as managed by the MPIQ and depressive symptoms of the patient, person living with dementia, both improve statistically. So it's the complications that it's managing. And if you look at the caregivers, these are three uh, indices. One is uh, the stress from behavioral symptoms. Uh, the second is um, a very nice instrument called the Modified Caregiver Strain Index, which is kind of an overall measure of impact. And then the third is PHQ-9, which is depressive symptoms. These all improve statistically uh, at one year. And finally, uh, utilization of cost. So uh, CMMI was uh, funding this, not so much for the goodness of their heart, but also to save money. Um, and we see a, a, a lot of changes in healthcare uh, utilization, some of which have been statistically significant, others are in the right direction. Um, ED visits, 20% uh, statistically significant reduction. Hospital days, 26% uh, statistically significant reduction. And this is because people are getting discharged uh, uh, earlier. They have shorter lengths of stay. And that's because the dementia care specialists uh, are proactive both with their hospital care and then uh, as soon as they're discharged. Uh, increased use of hospice care. And uh, this actually saves, these are uh, gross savings and not net savings, of about $2,400 per year uh, for, for Medicare fee for service. Uh, and finally, it's kind of an added bonus, um, the nursing home placement for long-term care 
uh, was reduced by about 40 percent. So all this was done um, uh, in the context of uh, a case, a very large case series of about uh, over uh, about 1,100 people, uh, but it's never been subjected to a clinical trial. So this uh, gets us to DCARE, and uh, I will just have to big big thank yous to the University of uh, of Wisconsin, Cynthia, Cynthia Carlson, who's our chair of our DSMB. Uh, this is a trial that. Um, is uh, sponsored by PCORI and NIA. And it is a, um, uh, to compare the effectiveness and cost effectiveness of, of, of three arms, community-based dementia care uh, versus health system-based uh, dementia care, and compare both to usual care at a foresight uh, pragmatic trial. Uh, the three arms are health system-based dementia care, uh, which is, based on the UCLA Alzheimer's and Dementia Care Program. The second is community-based dementia care by a social worker or a nurse uh, care consultant. Uh, this was developed by uh, the BRI in, uh, in Cleveland uh, and has had a lot of uh, studies and successes associated with it. And then the usual care is basically giving the uh, Alzheimer's Association's helpline uh, and that is staffed by master's level uh, consultants. These are our four trial sites, Geisinger uh, in uh, Pennsylvania, Wake Forest University in North Carolina, the two sites in Texas, Baylor Scott and White, and uh, UTMB in Galveston. Uh, this is a pragmatic 18-month trial. Uh, the sample size is 2,150, uh, 1,000 in each of the uh, intervention arms, and 150 in the usual care arm. And, and basically, to get in the study, you have to be community living. If somebody's already in a nursing home or in hospice, these interventions uh, don't have as much to offer. They have to have a diagnosis of dementia. This is not a dementia prevention or mild cognitive impairment study. Um, uh, you have to have a family member or a friend caregiver who speaks English or Spanish. And you have to have a partnering physician because uh, these are co-management models. Uh, our outcomes are going to be uh, behavioral symptoms, that's uh, the patient outcome, and then our other um, uh, caregiver outcome is the modified caregiver strain index. And then we have a slew of secondary outcomes and tertiary outcomes and who knows the quaternary outcomes. So I'm going to um, close with uh, going back to uh, population health. Um, we talked about this pyramid, and I'm going to just show you an example of uh, how it relates to dementia and, uh, and go through an example of some very exciting work we're doing at UCLA. Uh, so uh, we, we did this population-based uh, exercise of categorizing all the UCLA patients uh, with respect to uh, risk, and we found that the, the top 1%. So we, we had about we had about fifty thousand, excuse me, about five thousand people with dementia at UCLA. That top one percent, those fifty people, <laughs> they are extraordinarily high utilizers. Uh, about one hundred eighty-six thousand dollars on average, forty-nine bed days, four point eight ICU days, four point seven ED visits. But you see, uh, as you go down the tiers, the largest swath. These are people the. Um, 61% to 100%, uh, which is 1,990 people, uh, they have no bed days, no ICU days, no ED visits. They're managing their, um, their dementia you know, pretty well. So you wanna have different types of interventions based on, on uh, the severity. So we, we did that. We went through the exercise of um, the top 1%, uh, they need something called, uh, what we call the extensive, uh, extensivist clinic, which is a uh, small panel size, more intensive, uh, more supported uh, practice. Uh, we have something called the MDP program, which is in-home care. Uh, they get their primary care at home. These people are also referred to the Alzheimer's and Dementia Care Program. Uh, oftentimes, if they have multiple admissions, it's a revolving door of in and out of the hospital. Um, they refer to palliative care. 
And then um, some of them uh, just keep getting rehospitalized for recent urinary tract infections, and they're referred to urogynecology. So at each of the levels, um, we have different um, different uh, interventions. So for example, in um, for those people who are at the bottom of the pyramid, for most of those people, they're doing pretty well. And we have an information and referral service that gives local resources and institutional resources. So what we have done is uh, to use the electronic health record exploit, as I like to say, to um, identify people who have dementia in a registry. And that registry is based on the popular on uh, the problem list. We're getting all the docs to um, to add dementia as a problem. Uh, that's no mean task to try to get doctors to change their behavior and enter dementia, but we're, we're doing it. And then they can be referred based on specific criteria to one of three longitudinal programs in home visit, that extensive clinic or extensive clinic or the Alzheimer's and dementia care program or to uh, three different um, consultative services, palliative care, urogynecology and uh, pharmacy for medication recommendation. And these are an example of some, uh, some uh, the way the algorithm works. Somebody who has 21 uh, bed days per year, uh, two admissions or four ED visit, and uh, they have heart failure, end stage renal disease or dialysis or frequent UTIs. They get referred to the uh, extensivist. Uh, if they have six bed days, two admissions, three ED visits, uh, or a psych admission, or pneumonia or falls, they are referred to the ADC. So all of these are being done uh, under the hood of the electronic health record. So uh, we have just begun to pilot the algorithms in uh, this month. Uh, we have a three month pilot in geriatrics because tremendous things are going wrong. Anytime you set up a new electronic health system, something is going to go wrong. So we have a lot of social capital in geriatrics. So we, we are the canaries down the mine shaft. Um, but um, we plan to uh, the, uh, the computer changes that we've made will be generalizable and will go out to the rest of the population uh, physicians uh, come uh, the new year. So the take home message is that healthcare uh, of older persons one size cannot fit all. You have to think about population health. You think of, think about the healthier people who are at the bottom of the pyramid and the, uh, the very sick and frail people uh, who are at the top. Uh, population health approaches will be needed to make sure that all patients receive the right type, and the right amount of care. You don't want to take a resource that costs you $1,200 a year and apply it to somebody who's using no health care. It just doesn't make sense. Uh, Co-management programs are promising for chronic conditions that need a lot of attention and for appropriate patients. And, and finally, physicians need to be able to delegate and function as part of a team. Uh, the, the time of the solo cowboy uh, is over. Uh, I was speaking to some people yesterday and, and about the culture change uh, that uh, at our institution, where 10 years ago, a uh, um, nurse practitioner was a four letter word. And in fact, that uh, people are much more uh, team like and, uh, and working together. So uh, stay tuned, uh, the wheel's still in spin. And I'll close with a final slide. And that is uh, from the Think Different campaign, and and one of uh, one of my heroes uh, uh, for his songwriting, uh, Bob Dylan. So thank you very much. I know we only have a couple of minutes, but I'm glad to answer any questions. Great. Well, thank you so much um, for a wonderful overview of the program and uh, the challenging studies um, to do in this space um, and the the great uh, work that's being done. Um, I, I will start with a, a question. Um, in terms of the pyramid of how you group the patients, do patients progress up the pyramid or do you start off at the top and that's where you are? So do you expect the people at the bottom of the pyramid to move move on up? Yeah, most of most people start at the bottom of the pyramid, although some age into uh, uh, with, with illnesses. Um, they talk about this thing called rising risk, which is a bad term because there, there is no dynamic there. 
Um, but it's it's the transition generally from the bottom parts of the parrot to the higher part. And what you want to try to do is to prevent rising risk. You want to keep people, uh, and this is where public health uh, and other kind of preventive measures really come into play. And perhaps if we were investing more resources into public health uh, and to preventive measures, we would keep more people uh, at the bottom of the pyramid longer. Yeah. And then there's a, a question, an important question about the reimbursement model um, for providing uh, this sort of team based approach, particularly for community based um, support. What, what do you see the barriers and opportunities um, for that? Yeah, well, the, the big barrier is, is the way we traditionally pay for healthcare or fee for service. Um, I think the opportunities, uh, obviously managed care is an opportunity, but but they're unrolling a number of, uh, of alternative payment models, um, uh, primary care first and direct contracting that give a lot more flexibility. Uh, and one of the things uh, I didn't get into the, the hood is that we are actually paying our community-based organizations to provide services for our patients with Alzheimer's disease through a voucher program. And so that there need to be structures and, and processes in place to transfer money from uh, from um, healthcare dollars into community service dollars, and that that's going to be a challenge, but it's it is doable. Um, then uh, Mahela also wants to know. There's, there's been a, a number of articles recently about the use of robots in, in particularly in geriatric care. Um, any thoughts? Uh, robots are good for robot uh, work. Um, there are a number <laughs> of interesting things where they have these uh, robotic dogs and animals and stuff like that. And, and uh, I just was on service a couple of weeks ago and some lady had a little robot dog that she loved. She, she had no idea that it was, it was a robot. Um, you know, it, robotics are going to be uh, one one tool in the shed, and you're not going to be the entire tool shed. Uh, there's still that uh, that warm human touch. Uh, there's a warm human touch, uh, not only in the care uh, of patients uh, in their homes, et cetera, but also by uh, healthcare providers. And then there's a question uh, in terms of the people at the top of the pyramid. Uh, is it because they are they don't have a primary care physician or not closely linked to physician? Is that the explanation for their high utilization? So there there are many uh, explanations. There are many explanations. We have uh, our geriatric service at the hospital. Every time somebody gets readmitted uh, within thirty days, we reach out to the primary care doc. We reach out to the team that discharged and ask them why. And it turns out it's it's a lot of reasons. And it, it falls into several categories. Uh, one category are that new diseases happen. So somebody comes in the hospital, they're very uh, they're very sick, they go home and then they have a GI bleed. So it's a new condition that might happen. But frequently it's also because uh, when people are sicker that they haven't been able to amount the resources, uh, amass the resources to be able to keep people at home that are sick. So they are discharged at home, the family can't care for them, they wind up coming back, or they, they, uh, they don't follow through on recommendations, they don't get to a specialist in time. So th there are just many ways to fail uh, in terms of uh, that 1%. And that's why um, uh, I like to use this term for dementia patients is you have to adopt them. You have to be proactive. And that's our care coordinators and you have whole teams that are involved making sure these people don't fall through the cracks but sometimes they're just sick they're just sick people and uh, it's like a house of cards you pull one card out and you know, all these other things come, come down and sanjay do you uh, any last comments we're just yeah. about out of time yes <clears throat> thank you david <clears throat> i'm so sorry david thank you so much that was an outstanding presentation and you know the the beauty of your work, sure. and you showed here, uh, two most important geriatric problem syndromes, falls and dementia. And I think your work uh, uh, assessing different models uh, and very practical models that could be employed and sustained 
Uh, if the results were positive, I think it's just an amazing breakthrough research. And I'm glad that you're taking the dementia model and you're funded, I know, uh, recently by NIN Picori to the next level. And this will have so much of implications for caring for these patients. And I think that's what it's all about. So thank you for what you do and thank you for an amazing presentation. Thank you. I really appreciate this. Great. Well, thank you for the honor. I, yes. I wish I could be there in person. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get you back. The thing I have to say is everybody vote. Yes. <laughs> David has his button. Uh, I voted. Excellent. Um, Wisconsin's a key state. So thank you so much. Everybody stay safe and I look forward to um, next week's Grand Rounds. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.